the other thing I want to talk with you about, Tommy, is another area where, where you have a great amount of expertise, and that is around head injury. Um, hmm. About, uh, oh gosh, 10 years ago, I had a friend that suffered a very significant head injury uh, riding a bike down the street, and a jogger bolted out between some parked cars, didn't notice him riding, and they hit head to head. Hmm. Uh, you know, the jogger got the worst of it because he was wearing a helmet, but nevertheless, they were both devastated by this. He was going about 40 kilometers an hour. Um, she sustained multiple fractures to her head, um, but he sustained a concussion that was so bad that basically he wasn't himself for about two years. Um, mm -hmm. He's more or less himself now. Um, can you explain what a concussion is? Even Even this... Uh, like the idea of what concussion is, is quite hotly debated. Um, but in general, you would classify a concussion as a mild traumatic uh, brain injury uh, with more severe traumatic brain injuries. You might think of like complete open skull fractures and you know direct penetrating trauma to the brain, things like that. So this is, you know, the skull remains intact, but there has been some transmission of force or... Um, a, a, a wave, a blast wave, say if it's, if it's a blast injury that's been transferred uh, to the brain. Then at some level, in order to have symptoms of a concussion, you have some kind of disturbance of neuronal function. And that can either be because of, you know, abrupt loss. So there are some, you know, significant head uh, impacts in particular where you can get shearing of, of axons. Mm -hmm. um, a, you know, direct axonal injury of, of the neurons, and then you, that you know that cell is essentially is essentially lost as you sort of ripped it apart. Um, but even more, um, you know, milder impacts may cause uh, disturbances that include like the, the a neuron firing when it shouldn't. This can then sort of create this pattern of activation again that's not expected or in an area of the, the brain where it's you know. You're, wouldn't normally occur in a way that it wouldn't normally occur. And then this can then cause these downstream processes within cells that can cause uh, mitochondrial damage, swelling. You know, you then might see the accumulation of certain um, pathological proteins. So tau is, is it, like just like you see in Alzheimer's uh, dementia, it's also a response to um, a neuro like direct neuronal injury in a concussion. I, I work with a, a neurosurgeon who's... Uh, definition of concussion is any impact or force to the brain that causes the disturbance of function of one neuron. Um, unfortunately, that's not something that we can measure because uh, you probably need multiple or you know large sections of the brain to, to have uh, aberrant function for, for you to be able to actually measure it or detect it. Um, but you know those are the various processes that are going you're going on uh, you know when you get a, a head impact. So it could be as as quote unquote mild as just a headache for a few days um, following a, a head trauma, or it could be, you know, in the case of this friend of mine for a couple of years, uh, light was, they had a lot of photosensitivity. They had a lot of auditory sensitivity. They had difficulty, you know, processing things. They were much more irritable. Are, how common are those types of, you know, more severe symptoms than just a headache for a few days after a, a hit to the head? So, in reality, it's quite difficult to, to say how common things are because millions of concussions happen every year in the, in the US uh, alone, most of which probably go unreported. Um, and so it's only when you see more significant symptoms or, you know, something's, you know, it's happened in front of a, so you're playing sport, it's happened in front of a doctor, you know, you, you, you get a formal assessment. And, you know, the downstream effects are, you know, are varied, you know, can be around, uh, you know, verbal effects, photosensitivity, um, noise sensitivity, uh, effects of memory, focus, um, reaction time, you know, depending on, on, on how you're measuring things. And probably um, some of it is exactly which area of the brain uh, was, was impacted. And then there's, there's a systemic response aspect as well. So there are um, you know, we, it's, you, you can only really do this in animal studies, but um, part of the process of, of um, the, 
the sort of the disease process after traumatic brain injury is a systemic immune response that seems to sort of contribute uh, to, to, to some of the symptoms. So, you know, how much of an inflammatory response you get, how much of a fever do you get, um, that can then, you know, cause so, some issues throughout the brain um, a, 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 as well. So what do we know about the short-term management of concussion and the long-term and what is the relationship between a concussion and a traumatic brain injury, which are terms that I think both both people are hearing, and of course the term TBI in the past decade uh, is is sort of more front and center for people. Uh, I, I suspect in large part due to two things, right? Probably uh, a greater understanding of uh, TBI occurring in the battlefield, and also in at least one sport, American football, though obviously it occurs mm. in more than that. Yeah. So, like I said, the um, concussion is generally considered, uh, you know, within the so t so all of these are TBIs, traumatic brain injuries okay. of you know var various severities. A concussion is sometimes also known as a mild traumatic TBI, mm -hmm. a mild traumatic brain injury, or MTBI. And then, and I, and I think this is where probably most of our, you know, focus today will be on because, you know, the more severe brain injuries, so say if you do have skull fractures or penetrating head trauma, or you have, you know, significant loss of consciousness that requires, you know, intensive care, you know, that requires specialist neurosurgical treatment that's, that's probably beyond what most people here will be thinking about. But if instead you're thinking about concussions, on the sports field or blast related or, or sub concussive uh, uh, exposures, which might happen again in, uh, in sports or in the military. Um, and there's increasing evidence that says that sub concussive um, impacts or, or blasts. So uh, an example would be sniper fire, right? You essentially have a mini explosion happening right next to your head um, several times a day right if you're if if you're in the range practicing and there's some evidence to suggest that even that over time the damage can accumulate and cause uh, issues with cognitive function and there you call it subconcussive because each individual one doesn't necessarily cause symptoms but depending on how you define uh, concussion you may or may not get um, symptoms anyway so there's kind of a gray area there but you know each individual one would you wouldn't be able to detect it mm -hmm. really um, but the damage seems to accumulate over time if you have a significant um, head impact, so say on the sports field is probably again where people are most familiar with it, there's probably two aspects that are worth separating. So there's the, there's the formal medical process and medical assessment that you should undergo. And there will people who made, you know, in uh, multiple sports now, they may have some baseline cognitive testing so that when you do get a concussion, they retest you. They make sure that you get closer to uh, your previous baseline before you're allowed to play again. So things like um, the impact uh, assessment is often used in um, sort of youth and college sports. Um, and so there's that part. But then what I'm particularly interested in is how can we mitigate the effects of an impact initially? Like are there supplementation and other strategies that we can do to make the, the athlete who's or somebody who's at high risk of concussions more resilient to that impact um, and are there other things that we can do to support uh, recovery or minimize the effect of, of the impact? So with the, with the short-term sort of post-concussion management, there are um, two or three things that I think are particularly important. So the first is thermoregulation, and, which is basically managing normal body temperature. My PhD was actually looking at the effects of temperature on response to brain injury. Uh, and it's very clear that the hotter your brain gets after an injury, the worse your outcome. Pretty much any type of brain injury, stroke, traumatic brain injury, you know, uh, also these neonatal and pediatric brain injuries that I study. And we know that a lot of sports happen in heat stressed environments. So you're on the field, you're hot already, or you're out in the sun, and if ex experimentally, if you heat that brain up first, which happens during exercise, and then you have an impact and then that brain stays hot, that, can, that seems to, to worsen outcomes. So getting somebody out of a heat stressed environment, cooling them down if you need, if you need to and you, and you can use external, um, external ways to do that, 
You can use things like Tylenol to help uh, uh, regulate body temperature. And that particularly becomes important because this, uh, at some point, a few hours later, an inflammatory response is going to kick in and it's very common to get fever. There's been a big, um, you know, I mean, it's decades of work. How long does that, um, th does the, does the um, sort of power or potential of that intervention last? So if a person has a concussion, you know, at, two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon mm. is, should they be in an environment of taking Tylenol and cooling themselves off for the rest of the day? Or is that something that would, you'd want to carry out for a couple of days and just continue round the clock Tylenol to keep, uh, to prophylactically ward off fever? That's a great question. And it's something that the field probably still struggles with. Um, but a period of 24 to 72 hours after the initial injury is probably the most critical. Um, the, the most important thing is preventing fever. And the reason why, the reason why, uh, fever causes issues is because you create, you increase the mismatch between metabolic rate and capacity to produce mm -hmm. energy to match that metabolism. So if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, you're basically increasing that gap in terms of required energy production, which then, um, exacerbates the injury. Any evidence for cooling, Tommy? So for example, I mean, obviously, as you know, from your work, um, when you're doing uh, certain types of heart surgery, you can actually cool the patient to 19 degrees Celsius, at least back when I yeah. was training, that was the sweet spot. I don't know if what the temperature is today. But if you were um, basically doing anything where you had to cross clamp the aorta, uh, and prevent mm. cerebral perfusion, you would, you know, uh, you would, you would cool the patient, literally have ice around their head. The anesthesiologist would cool the patient. Um, yeah. and obviously that was very protective. So is there any evidence mm. that someone sustaining a concussion should go beyond just getting out of the sun and taking Tylenol, but perhaps be laying down and be, you know, bathed or at least have their head covered in ice? So the, the short answer is no, there's no evidence for that. Um, and then there's a long story. To, to answer that question. So in animal models, and again, this is something that I've, I've published extensively on, hypothermia is magic for acute brain injuries, right? If you can decrease core temperature by three to four degrees Celsius for, you know, three, you know, 24 hours to 72 hours after the injury, you, know, you get a significant reduction in, in brain injury. In one specific scenario, and that's acute, um, acute uh, brain injury in babies that have some kind of issue around birth, therapeutic hypothermia, so cooling to 33.5 degrees Celsius core temperature for three days is the standard of care. It was brought into the resuscitation guidelines and, in and 2010. They, they do that just externally. They're not using ECMO or anything like yes. that. Yes. Okay. No. Uh, so if uh, the so some of those kids can go on ECMO, but that's because of respiratory failure, and and so you can cool on pump. But no, this is a just an external cooling with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a blanket. In models of TBI, it is similarly neuroprotective in animals. Um, huge bodies of work say that if you, if you create a, a traumatic brain injury in an animal model and then cool that animal down, they get decreased injury. Dozens of trials, billions of dollars have been spent trying to replicate this in humans and it has not worked. Um, and you know, people thought the temperature wasn't right, the duration wasn't right. You know, obviously, in traumatic brain injury, you have a very heterogeneous population. Maybe the population wasn't right. Um, but in reality, there's no evidence that hypothermia works uh, for concussions or any kind of traumatic brain injury. Uh, but what what does seem to work is maintaining normothermia. So basically, co uh, a core temperature at or below 36.5 degrees Celsius, uh, ideally. There are some people out there who will sell cool caps uh, and things. And, and there are, you know, I think I once spoke on, on a podcast and, and said what I just said. And somebody emailed me and was like, here's my unblinded open study of my cool cap in some hockey players that shows that it improves recovery from concussion. Um, there is no high quality evidence that these things work. Um, partic so particularly because externally cooling the brain, you're probably not going to get the brain cold enough to do it you know, what you need to do is you would need to cool the blood Carotids, going up into the yeah. brain. So, yeah. Um, but in reality, I don't think there's much evidence there. So focusing on preventing fever or managing fever, I think is very beneficial, but then active cooling below that doesn't seem to, to add anything. And, and these studies, 
they demonstrated they were they were actually cooling the neck. They were demonstrating that they were achieving a significant reduction in brain temperature. So not um, so these external devices like cooling the neck um, in individuals con with concussion that hasn't been shown to be beneficial when when they've trialed hypothermia. Um, oh, I just mean, but, but did they demonstrate? Did they actually demonstrate efficacy of cooling? Not that it reduced no. con concussion, but did they show that they can cool the brain? No. So this is another issue: is that um, particularly with milder external forms of cooling, how do you know the brain is actually exactly. being cooled? And so yeah. sometimes, so in, in these studies, you may see, like particularly if they're doing external cooling on the scalp, they'll uh, do. Uh, they'll measure scalp temperature and say, well, the scalp is colder, therefore the brain is colder. That's not necessarily yeah, the case. Right. So, so no, uh, there, there isn't documented evidence that these things can directly significantly cool brain temperature. Yeah. So, so there's two problems, right? One is we don't know if we're even cooling the brain in these studies. And of course, therefore, we don't know if cooling the brain would, would uh, minimize or mitigate this risk. It could be the complexity of the human model and given our surface area relative to, you know, tiny, you know, infants have a, a surface area uh, amount that allows for easy external cooling. In fact, that's one yeah. of the challenges of taking care of pediatric patients is they're very susceptible to insensible losses in the way that adults are not. So you hear you're mm -hmm. using it to your advantage. So that's very interesting. If it doesn't work, in other words, if we could be sure that those studies are indeed cooling the brain but it is not having an impact. What is your explanation for the discordance between that and the pediatric and animal literature? So there are, there are two potential things that, that, that could conceivably remain as our answer questions. So one is that the majority of cooling studies, although this has been overcome in a lot of them, but the majority of cooling studies are probably not cooling soon enough. So there's actually a very narrow window um, again, based on animal studies that says in an acute brain injury, you basically need to start cooling therapy within six hours, but probably ideally within three hours of the injury. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're running a clinical trial, That's this person impossible. has to be yeah. found, right? It's the same as doing thrombolysis in stroke, like trying to get it as soon as possible. It's very difficult. So if you could immediately cool, maybe, maybe that's part uh, of the issue. The other issue um, which uh, is, is potentially a little bit controversial, but I think is increasingly being appreciated in the neonatal literature, is that when they did the original cooling trials, the control group were kept at 37 degrees Celsius and had a lot of fever. So it could be... Oh, you mean the controls were managed with Tylenol and thermoregulation to keep them at 37? No, so so originally they, they would, um, in those original cooling trials in neonates, the control group was hot. So if you yeah. look at a baby's normal temperature after they're born, they don't immediately go to 30, 37 degrees Celsius. They may never get there. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll slowly warm up over a day or so. But though in those trials, the control group were immediately warmed up to 37, mm -hmm. and they also pre uh, frequently had fever, and they weren't managing those fevers because they were... Because that was in the era where you were worried about the kids getting cold. Yeah, so in other words, you may hot. have you may have made the controls worse off and artificially created Ex a gap. Exactly. So in more modern cooling trials, they do targeted temperature management in the control group. So the control group is kept at thirty six point five um, uh, degrees Celsius core temperature, and then compared to that, the cooling group doesn't seem to have a benefit. So. Some of the effect in neonates may be due to uh, a worsening of outcome in the control group rather than benefit in the intervention group.